Hey everyone, welcome to The Sword and Laser, episode number 175. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt, hoping that Veronica makes sure she tells me when we go live. I was telling you we were going live! I was telling you, that was like almost a buzz out loud situation circa like 2005. <laughs> literally. Like, yeah. Literally. Hey, welcome to The Sword and Laser. Hey, um, we are welcome also live streaming this. I am back from China. Thank you so much, Tom, and also Josh Lawrence for doing things like going to the Nebulas and going to Baycon and getting a bunch of awesome interviews that have, you know, that we're going to use in the next com coming weeks and also so filling exciting. the spots while I was gone. Um, I can't wait to hear the interviews myself. You, you got some great guests. Yeah, we had Anne Leckie in the feed last week, and most people probably caught that. Uh, and mm -hmm. congratulations to Anne Leckie on winning everything. All the things. And next week, uh, we'll have two interview episodes for you. Just a little bounty. Uh, Chip Delaney is apparently what the friends call him. I still call him Samuel Delaney. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have the interview with him from the Nebula Awards where he was the Grandmaster. And David Weber was the guest of honor at Baycon. So I got to sit down with chat with him. And that'll be in the feed next week as well. Yeah, I'm really excited for those um, two two greats for sure that you yeah. that you nabbed for the show. Um, we've been trying to get David Weber on for a while actually, so I'm glad you got him in an uh, enclosed space. Really, really <laughs> nice guy. Really interesting to talk to, uh, and and some amazing stories were told over the course of the weekend. You'll get a you'll get a couple samples of those in the interview. Fantastic. Um, if you guys are new listeners, uh, Sword and Laser is the science fiction and fantasy podcast, book club, video show, uh, book publisher now, and all sorts of great stuff. We have events all over the country. Um, we do a lot of fun stuff together, and we hope you will enjoy being part of the group. Um, right now, we are just wrapping up The Martian by Andy Weir, which we'll talk about later in the episode. We'll also announce the next book um, for the month of June, so stay tuned for that. But first, uh, what are you drinking, Tom? I am enjoying a Smithwick's Premium Irish Ale this afternoon. Hmm. Ooh, I am also drinking like uh, the beers. I am drinking an oh. Anchor uh, California Lager. Is, ah. it an is it Anchor Steam? It's Anchor Steam, right? Or is well, it just I don't know Anchor? If it's steam. It's Are those the different beers. It does Anchor Steam because it's a steam method of brewing that they use. Oh, I did so not I don't know, know if that. the California Lager is steam brewed or not. It may not be. I don't know as much about beer as many of my contemporaries and friends do. Uh, believe me, and I don't know much about beer at all. I mean, go watch New Brew Thursday or something like that if you want to know about beer. We just drink it. Yeah, my oh my friend, um, my friend Mike does a does a beer show also, uh, whose name is escaping me, and I feel terrible for not being able to remember it. Just but look they... up Mike Beer Show. <laughs> <laughs> you probably find it. You'll find it for sure. All right, well, let's jump right into the quick burns, which is our news of the week. Yes, and uh, thank you to everybody who's been posting more news into the Goodreads forum. We're, we're trying to pull the stuff you want to talk about. Jenny posted the Nebula winners, uh, which, uh, as we mentioned, and Leckie won for Ancillary Justice. Yay! Um, best novella was The Weight of Sunrise by Viler Kaftan. Best novelette, The Waiting Stars, Aliette de Baudard. And best short story, If You Were a Dinosaur, My Love, by Rachel Swirsky. Yep, we had her on the video show, too, and she's known for her short stories, and it seems as though this one did not disappoint come award season. So I haven't read it yet myself, but um, actually, maybe I did read it. Because I, I think around the time I heard about her short story, I remembered that uh, that poem that I that I wrote uh, back at Dragon Con last year about the T-Rex. Do you remember? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, darn, Rachel Swirsky wrote a short story that had dinosaurs I in it. I remember that. Arr. Like, like I had any claim on on dinosaurs as but, a thing. You, know, you could you could carve out your own niche in the my own niche of of angry sweary in dinosaur the land poems. Of the lost, so to speak. Right. Oh, and don't forget, uh, we shouldn't forget Alfonso Cuarón won for the Ray Bradbury Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation for Gravity. For Gravity, and, yeah. Uh, Sister Mine by Nalo Hopkinson won the Andre Norton Award for Young Adult Science Fiction. Yeah, okay. Gravity beat out a lot of great stuff, including the Day of the Doctor, the Doctor Who um, episode. Uh, Doctor Who often wins this, too. These not too surprising. Yeah. Um, Her by Spike Jones, uh, The Hunger Games, which, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of surprising that that was in there. Also, Pacific Rim. I'll tell you what surprised me was the uh, thread on Goodreads where people were like, yeah, I didn't think Ancillary Justice was going to win. We told you, we already told you a year ago that Ancillary Justice was going to win all the things. Why don't you listen to me? For goodness sake. Because I'm psychic. 
also, and I know these things. Veronica totally predicted that Gary Whitta would write a Star Wars movie. <laughs> I <laughs> did not. Uh, Gary Witta uh, is is a dear friend of mine, and um, he is also. Uh, I I first met him uh, when I was working at Future, uh, the the publishing company, and uh, he had been the editor of PC Gamer back in the day, and he has gone on to become a a well renowned screenwriter. He did Book of Eli. He did um, uh, After Earth, um, and. Now he's doing the new Star Wars film, the new standalone Star Wars film. And that is kind of a big deal. It'll be directed by uh, Gareth Edwards, who just directed Godzilla, um, and it's due out in 2016. Yeah, this is going to be a side story. Uh, as you probably know, J.J. Abrams directing Episode 7, which is in the main canon. But every off year, 2016 in this case, they're going to put out what they're saying are, are single character looks. Not that there'll only be one character in the movie, but like the, the, the rumor is that it, the first one will be about Boba Fett, and so it'll just be a movie about him. That's kind of exciting. Oh, but Gary also wrote well. um, uh, The Walking Dead video game. Yeah, right. The first season of The Walking Dead we video game. We talked about that with him on season one of Sword and Laser Video. We Actually, did. I'm and I'm sorry game. if... I don't know if that audio just got picked up um, on on Audio Hijack, but there was an ad that popped up on PCGamer.com. So if you heard something, you that's know, what it was. That yeah, it didn't come over to me, so it probably didn't get in there. Sorry about that. Uh, who knows? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it didn't. In hey, um, the Word Zone uh, pointing out at an event in Santa Fe recently, Ryan Condal said he is working on a pilot script for a TV series based on the lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. Oh, that is so awesome. I can I really hope this happens because the whole time I was reading the lies of Locke Lamora, I was like this should be a show. Like I can totally see this as like a mini series or like, you know, even a full season because there's there's m many books now in the Gentleman Bastard series. Um, so I think I think that it makes total sense. The characters are great. They speak in a very modern kind of way that I think will translate well to television and there's a lot of action, romance, all all that good stuff. If you're wondering, uh, Condal also wrote the script for the new Hercules movie due out in July, starring Dwayne Johnson. Uh, he's working on a pilot for a series called The Sixth Gun, uh, based on the comic books by Cullen Bunn and Brian Hurt. Uh, when asked about this statement by Condal, Scott Lynch replied, I can neither confirm nor deny the denial or confirmation, uh, confirmation <laughs> of anything potentially requiring denial or confirmation. Okay. So he's totally happy. It's Daffy. I think I think the amount of double negatives in there um, leads me to believe that that will in fact happen. SF Signal uh, put up a list of everyone who will lose to Anne Leckie for the John W. <laughs> Campbell Memorial Award. <laughs> You're terrible, but yes, that is also probably true. All the people who like Hild out there are shaking their fists at me right now. But yeah, uh, oh, there's oh, a lot a of great group. stuff on here. Yeah, I mean, really I read good. I read Shaman by Kim Stanley Robinson. It was fantastic. Charles Strauss is on there. Dave Eggers is on there. Um, I Boxima haven't gotten around to reading Baxter. The Circle yet. What? Proxima by Stephen Baxter. Mm -hmm. uh, Alistair Perfect. Reynolds on The Steel Breeze just coming out here in the U.S. It's been out in the U.K. for a while. Hmm. So. Yeah, sorry guys. I mean, now I feel like we're just making it difficult for Anne to win anything no, else right. because we're just exactly. jinxing her left and right. She's gonna feel. She's gonna. Is she, do you think she'll feel let down if she doesn't win at this point? I don't think she will though. She's too humble. She's she's awesome and humble, and also probably she's like, oh, maybe other people can win. I, I think I can be okay with that. But also, yeah. a sweep would be cool too. Yeah. Um. It's, sad it's news. Tough competition. Yeah. Yeah, right. in, in yeah, Saturn news, um, H.R. Giger, uh, of course, best known for his work on the Alien film series, who he he created the uh, you know that the look of the xenomorphs that we're so very familiar with. Uh, of course, he's done tons of incredible artwork for many many different projects over the years. Um, he passed away. Very sad news. Um, I learned about that when I was in China, and uh, yeah, he had been not well for a while, um, to, to to what I remember. So. Oh, he um he passed away in Zurich after suffering injuries sustained in a fall at his home. He was seventy four. Yeah, um, always sad to to see a, a great talent like that leave. Uh, but you know, at least not cut down too early. Um, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, 74, I mean, lived a pretty good life. His his work will be remembered for for many many years to come. Absolutely. Yeah, totally sad news. Picks. 
Time for some picks. Uh, this is the segment we introduced uh, a couple episodes ago to take the place of the calendar after getting your your feedback, uh, where we talk about other things that we're reading besides the monthly Sword and Laser pick, as well as get some some stuff from you guys sometimes. So, by all means, in the what else you're are you reading section, uh, put in your suggestions. I am finally I'm embarrassed to say I've been reading this for more than a year now. Finally, getting towards the end of Zoe's Tale by John Scalzi. Um, it's been my third book. Like I'm always reading the Sword and Laser pick, and then there's always seems to have been something that had to come up. Like I had to read a David Weber book before I interviewed David Weber. You know, to kind of mm, get his uh-huh. voice in my head. Stuff like that has been coming up. Then Republic of Themes by Scott Lynch. I'm like, I have to read that. So I'm finally bearing down here and um, getting ready to finish Zoe's Tale. And I'm really impressed as I get near the end of the book, where you where she meets the Consu and she goes uh, to the general away from the part that happens in the book that it's based on, because if you don't know, it's a mirror uh, of, um, and now I'm blanking on the, the name of the book that it's the mirror of. Um, it's the But it, it's the one where they're on the colony. Um, I'm boring, Veronica. Mm. I'm sorry. sorry. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a retelling of a, of a book that he's already written, right? And that could go very wrong, but especially the parts where you're like, did he know he was going to write this when he write oh, the last colony? Did he did he know that he was going to you know he has these throwaway scenes essentially in the last colony with Zoe, but he turns them into these very substantive, meaningful scenes that make sense in the face of the story of Zoe's tale. And so I'm really so you feel like they're almost like companion books. They are such. I mean, they're meant to be companion books, but sometimes you might be like, oh, this is the part that's from Last Colony that he had to shoehorn in here. Never feels like that. It's amazing. Awesome. Um, I just finished a, a series myself, uh, the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy, uh, which concludes with Dreams of Gods and Monsters. And uh, we actually read the first book, Daughter of Smoke and Bone, for Vaginal Fantasy, and I just fell in love with the world. And so I, I gobbled up the second book, and then the third one just came out about a month ago. And uh, they actually, uh, Laini Taylor, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, uh, she, she follows some of the vaginal fantasy stuff, and her publisher sent us all copies. And oh, nice. I was just, like, so excited and blown away, and uh, it was phenomenal. It's about, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's about a girl named Karu, or Caro, um, who is, uh, I don't want to give too much away in case people are going to read the series, but uh, essentially there's a war going on in a world of a different dimension between um, Chimera and angels. And that war starts spilling over into onto Earth. And so it's about the relationships between these two different sides um, who are also very human. And it's, you know, there's magic and there's fighting and there's romance and it's, it's all very epic and it takes place in, in modern times. Um, and I, I loved the series and I, I found the conclusion to be very satisfying as well. Um, so I think if, if you're into that kind of stuff, if you like a strong female character also, um, main character, this is definitely a great trilogy for you. We'll put links to both of those in the show notes at swordandlaser.com. Uh, now, the whole calendar, swordandlaser.com slash calendar, is still there if you want to see everything that's coming out. Just a couple highlights. Today, Skin Game, the Dresden Files novel by Jim Butcher is out, as well as Thief's Magic by Trudy Canavan, who we've previously interviewed on the show mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I still have got to get caught up on the Dresden Files. Um, I haven't read Cold Days yet. I think I'm like maybe a book or two behind that one. Um, so I've got I've got some catching up to do, but I really want to get there because everyone talks about spoilers on the internet, and I feel like I'm really mm-hmm. I'm missing out on the series right now. Wah, wah. And do you want to tell them what's coming out June third? Sure, we've got The Long Childhood LP, a novel by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. Uh, we also have On the Steel Breeze, Poseidon's Children by Alistair Reynolds, and Shield and Crocus by Michael R. Underwood, who we just had on the show. Um, sounds like a really interesting book. I'm, I'm excited to pick that one up as well. Yeah, I'm excited about On the Steel Breeze. I, I should when, when the first one, Blue Remembered Earth, came out, I actually ordered the UK version of it. Uh, because I didn't want to wait. But this time, I've actually had such a long reading list that it was good. I was like, I'll just wait for the U.S. release. So this is... i got to finish up Zoe's Tale so I can get to On the Steel Breeze now. Ah. Well, listeners, uh, as you heard on the last episode, you can help Sword and Laser out by completing a short anonymous survey. It will take you no more than five minutes. That's if you're slow. That's if you're plotting. It'll take you five minutes. It'll probably take you less than that. And your answers help match our show... 
with advertisers that best fit the sensibilities of our podcast and you, the actual listeners. So complete the survey and you will be entered in an ongoing monthly raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card, mm. which could buy you many ebooks. I'm just. Yes, uh, we will not share or sell your email address. We promise. Uh, we won't send your email uh, anything unless you win. Then we'll send you the thing saying, hey, guess what? You won. You probably want to get that email. So go to www.podsurvey.com slash laser. Uh, and we haven't been putting this in the show notes or anything. I did post it on Goodreads because we want listeners to go there. So, so commit it to memory www.podsurvey.com slash laser. Uh, take the survey and get a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card to boot. Yep, that is P-O-D-S-U-R-V-E-Y dot com slash laser. Pod survey. And I've been looking at some of the results and they're very fascinating. Fascinating, Veronica. Very fascinating, Captain. Fascinating. <laughs> All right, it's time for Barrier Sword, which is our feedback from the audience. We kick it off with a not great review of the brand new Godzilla film. Um, I Have you seen it yet, Tom? No, I didn't see it. Uh, we were going to go see it, and then Roger Chang gave me a horrible review. See, we were going to go see it on a Saturday. Roger. Don't we listen We were going to go on a Saturday, but I was at the Nebula Awards all day, so I didn't have time mm -hmm. to see it that day. And then the Sunday, I was talking to Eileen, and she's like, well, what did Roger think? Because I mentioned he saw it. And I'm like, well... Roger said that the first half leads you to believe it's going to be one kind of movie, and then it turns into a different kind of movie, and he was disappointed. And that was enough to dissuade us. It's giant monsters fighting each other, Tom. Just go Is see it. Is it as good as Pacific Rim in that respect, in the giant monsters fighting each other respect? Because I love Pacific Rim only for the battles. I didn't care not about the plot holes. As, I'm going to say not as good as Pacific Rim in terms of the battles. Pacific Rim was pretty epic in that yeah. regard. But anyway, we're talking about Trike here, not us. He says, uh, so I finally saw Godzilla today. It was pretty dumb. <laughs> Even recalibrating the stupid -o meter for giant monsters doesn't stop it from being silly. I actually laughed out loud at one point, not out of delight, but because it was all so ridiculous. I'm on board with Kaiju. I thought Pacific Rim was pretty silly too, but I enjoyed it. And Godzilla, I just kept mocking it. Japanese are making fun of Godzilla's girth, calling him the fat American Godzilla, and they're totally right. I don't want to body shame a 100-story tall lizard, but he's gone pear-shaped in his old age. I don't think it was possible to make Pacific Rim look like a work of brilliance, but Godzilla manages just that. Considering that director Gareth Edwards' first movie was The Excellent Monsters, I was quite surprised. More money clearly doesn't equal better. If you really want to see it, wait for the DVD. It's a rental at best. Ooh. And then he goes on into some uh, spoilery observations in the spoiler tags. Um, I, you know, I, I thought it was fun. I really enjoyed it. I, I was kind of sad that some... I don't want to get into spoileriness, um, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut, but... There were some. Let me let me put it this way because I've, I've already been spoiled. Maybe you were disappointed with the level of involvement in the story of Brian Cranston's character. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But I thought um, I I thought uh Ken Watanabe's character just didn't get to do enough. He kind of had a lot of like one-liners that were kind of like okay. He just kind of like walked around looking bewildered most of the time. I hear he um, did really good at that though. He did really well at that. He's apparently great at that. He's a great actor though, so to kind of like you waste know, him on that. Waste him felt kind of sad. Um Brian Cranston yelled a lot and yeah. then the kid from Kick-Ass was kind of like a little boring. Not so Kick-Ass. Not, not quite so kick-ass. And well, Elizabeth Olsen just looked like an Olsen. This is an argument, from my perspective, not to go see it. Uh, but and it's instead, fun! It's Godzilla. The X-Men Days of Future Past, which the fact that I have in our Night Attack Summer movie draft has no bearing on that recommendation. Um, did you see X-Men? No, I haven't seen that because it was a Baycon this weekend. Oh, gosh. I ruined my, my travels, ruined all of your movie watching. I couldn't see any movies this month because Veronica was in China. I saw all the movies this weekend when I came back. That so I got back and I went on I went on, you know, Sunday night and then on mm -hmm. on That's Monday great. we went on That's great. Yeah. Glad you I was tired I was really tired though. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. If that makes you feel better. Baseball game too, didn't X-Men was good, but I've more enjoyed reading all the continuity problems that it has caused in the X-Men universe. So that that's also kind of fun. Well, let's also talk about uh, the fan-made trailer 
for Jim Butcher's next Dresden Files book, which Tamahome posted up to an io9 article, but it pretty much is just the embedded video. Uh, it, this is it's a trailer for Skin Games. It's pretty good for fan made, I gotta say. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I was. Although impressed. that does not what Harry Dresden looks like to me. I'm sorry. He looks like the guy from the sci-fi. He looks like the guy from the show. Yeah, even when I watch Arrow, which has that actor as a cop, I'm like, oh, look, Harry Dresden's on the screen right now. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I, I haven't watched all of Arrow, but I was I was excited to see him back. As, he's the dad, he's right? Like, he's a great actor, yeah. He's uh, Lauren's dad. Yeah. Not, not Oliver Queen's dad. He is, he is underused in, in, in film and, and television, in my opinion. He gets um, some pretty good screen time in later Arrow episodes, just saying. Oh, good, oh, good. But we're here to talk about the Dresden Filers trailer. Yes. Um, I didn't watch the whole thing yet, but it looked really well done. Yeah. You watched it, right? Yeah. Again, the guy that they have playing Harry Dresden, no disrespect to him. He does a fine job in the trailer. Uh, Just doesn't look the way I imagine Harry Dresden. But that's kind of my only criticism. Other than maybe there are some production effects levels that they would have just had to have way more money to smooth out. Like, you can tell some matting going on. That's really picky stuff, though. I mean, it's a fan made trailer. For sure. They did this out of the love for totally. the content, yeah. which is amazing and always really impressive. And Especially with live action team to stuff. Agree. Good. Um, well, I guess we should move on to our discussion of this month's book pick, uh, The Martian by Andy Weir. Well, before we start, do that, talk about before June first. Shut off to avoid spoilers, because remember we're keeping the discussion to the end of the show now, so that if you don't want to be spoiled, you can just. Sh- I know we decided all these things, and then I don't remember all the things we decided. Um, I went to well, China. My brain no, was erased. This is this is book discussion time. I just want to let people know about what the next book will be before we get into spoilers. Okay, the next book, uh, it was pretty much in the lead the entire time the poll was up this past month. Uh, Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan, who we've had on the show. Um, if you remember correctly, this is the uh, the the magical uh, system where uh, powder. Pardon. They're powder mages, and so they use gunpowder as the source of their abilities, um, or at least the kind of the the igniter of their abilities. Um, but there's other kinds of magic in the book as well. Um, but we'll read this little little blurb about it. Uh, Field Marshal Thomas's coup against his king sent corrupt aristocrats to the guillotine and brought bread to the starving, but it also provoked a war with the Nine Nations, internal attacks by royalist fanatics, and the greedy to scramble for money and power by Thomas's supposed allies, the church, workers' unions, and mercenary forces. Yeah, uh, this is, I've, I've been already reading this, because Hounded by Kevin Hearn was right on the heels. Which we've both read. Was hounding uh, promise of blood the whole way through the month, and it, it could have jumped in front at any point. And it, we should definitely read Hounded by Kevin Hearn at some point as a book. Yeah. It's really good. But I went ahead and started reading Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan using the audiobook. Fantastic narrator there, and really am sucked into what is a three perspective story, which is sometimes hard to pull off, but he does it well. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm excited that you guys are go- that we're all going to read this together. Um, I I was really excited about learning it. Uh, learn sorry, blah, blah, learning about it uh, when we had Brian on the show, and I have not been disappointed by this book at all so far. Um, some of the reviews that I've read were like, oh, you know, there's too much going on. The story doesn't really fit in together in certain ways, and I I don't I'm not done yet. I'm only about 75 percent of the way through, so I can't kind of make that judgment call yet. Um, but I I've been enjoying it. I'm about the same way through myself, and I have to say it feels like the first book in a long planned series. Mm-hmm. So there are subplots that are going to resolve themselves, you can tell, and there are major plots, especially uh, regarding Taniel uh, and uh, and regarding uh, Thomas' uh, relationship with Taniel. Uh, and as and as well as the investigator, and now his his name is Andrew. Yeah, Adarak. Uh, <laughs> are you reading it or listening to it? I'm listening to it. Oh, um, so, so they say Thomas? Yeah, but Thomas, it's T A M A S. Thomas, I think. Thomas. Anyway, there are there are those overarching storylines that you can tell are not going to be resolved mm-hmm. uh, before the end of this book. So. That is something to keep in mind is you are not going if you're one of those people like I want to feel all resolved by the end of this you're not like this is this is part of a larger series and it and it feels that way. Mm-hmm. 
Also, right. a warning, if you're going out to get the print version, you may not want to buy it at Amazon uh, because Hachette and Amazon are having a little cat fight over who gets to pay who how much money to carry their books. Uh, it doesn't affect the e-books or the audio books, but it does affect the print book shipping. Amazon's kind of being snitty about it really? and like delaying shipping and stuff. Uh, so we'll have a link to the pals.com uh, listing for this as well on the show notes. So you, if you want to order the print book that way or just get it from your library or something like that. Yeah, um, I, I heard a little bit about that uh, on Twitter while I was in China, uh, you know, tunneling in through a VPN, um, but I didn't follow up on the story. So you'll, I'll have to look, look up all that drama uh, after the show. Drama. The drama, drama-rama. Um, but yeah, let's take the time now to wrap up The Martian by Andy Weir. So get away, spoiler-averse people. Yeah, if you don't want spoilers, now is the time to GTFO. Um, so, The Martian. Uh, do you want to talk about our thoughts first and then and then read the comments from the forums? Sure. I adored it. Yeah? Um, for many of the reasons that people stated that they didn't like it, I adored it. I love The Constant Peril. It is a, a favorite story of mine, the uh, post-apocalyptic scenario or, uh, or, or basically abandonment a certain death <laughs> scenario. <laughs> I love those. So I, I, I'll, I'll fully admit up front, like, this is my kind of story. Guy abandoned on Mars, facing certain death around every corner. Absolutely adore that. I loved that Tom Hanks movie uh, where he was abandoned on the island for the same reason. Cast I away. Lost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm prone to liking it. But I love the fact that Andy Weir made a serious attempt to get the science right. And we'll talk about how close he got in a little bit. Uh, but he got closer than a lot of people would. And he uh, and he had a likable character to me, right? Uh, it's a character that was believable in saying things that were funny and having real human reactions uh, to Steph rather than being some kind of cold calculating uh, mission scientist type. And, and you needed that or else the story was not going to work. So I thought he, he struck that balance really well. I was a little bit, not disappointed, but I kind of saw the way that it ended coming. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, he's not going to show us the homecoming. He's just going to leave us, you know, on, on the way. And, and that's what he did. And I don't know if he's doing that on purpose to show us that homecoming later. Uh, but I re that's my one regret is I really wanted to see him back on Earth. Uh, I, I, want, I want to see that, e even if it's not in this book, maybe in another book sometime. Did you want that payoff? Yeah, because he I mean, you knew he was going to survive. That's always the thing with these books. Like, most of the time, 99% of the time, they survive. And part of the fun is going through the trial and then seeing Sandra Bullock lay down on the, you know, on the ground on the earth at the end of gravity. And, and you know, maybe that's a spoiler for people, but come on, you had to guess that. Um, being able to see, like, oh, okay, this, this is what we've been cheering for the whole time. I mean, we mm -hmm. want this. You get that because he does get back to the to the ship, right? He does make it onto the ship in orbit. And I guess yeah, that's supposed still a to far way that. out. Yeah. You know, there's, there's still so much peril to come. But that's, I guess that that's a whole other story to tell. And maybe he's reserving that. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe that is coming. Uh, who knows? Um, we should have asked him that maybe when we interviewed we him, but we him. hadn't read the book at the time. He wouldn't have told us. He'd been yeah. like, I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Yeah. Um, I also think? I also really loved the book. Um, I loved I loved the main character, um, uh, Watley Watley. Right. I've already moved on to the next book, so I'm already starting to yeah. W Watney Watney. Um, yes, with an N. Yes, Watney. Um, I get the peril thing. I was sensing that already before I even saw the forum thread about it. I was like. Like I understand you're on Mars, but geez, everything is is it's literally life or death at every turn. And I was starting to get like a little every time things would calm down, I'm like, all right, the next entry is gonna be like him, <laughs> you know, he's blown out the hab, oh, or, hab or something, you know, something's yeah. gone terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, and and inevitably it would. Um, people were commenting too about how it was uh, weird that. You know, even though he had a giant wound in his side, uh, he just took a few painkillers and antibiotics. And my dog is trying to break out of her kennel. <laughs> We're puppy sitting a new dog, and she doesn't know really how to um, 
behave herself like Lie for down over more there. than ten minutes. I can't. I couldn't put her in a down and just hope for the best. Um, so she's in the kennel during the show, uh, but she's trying to break free because it's her dinner time. Uh, so we gotta wrap this up. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, so he got injured, and then he just kind of took some antibiotics and painkillers, and we never really heard about the injury that much again. Um, so, you know, apparently, magically, he was able to to heal thyself, um, gave himself stitches, and just went on his merry way. Uh, so stuff like that was a little bit unbelievable, but I guess if you're as smart as you would have to be to be a, an engineer going to Mars, then you probably know how to do things like that. Um, what else? There was another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I did find, I mean, I enjoy the science jargon, but sometimes it would go on for pages and pages and pages, and it was like, ah, math, like endless math. And even when he made Ninja Pirates and things like that, I was still like, oh, this is all like flipping forward, like getting to the Were next thing that happens. Uh, in text or doing the audiobook? Text. Yeah, I can see that being different, that uh, being a totally different experience than having it told to you. It was very dense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm a nerd. I love that kind of stuff. It was just like, it was a little, little bit too much. It was almost like, okay, we get it. You did the research. Like, okay, good job. You know the math. I just don't well, want to have to That's what I mean. Like, in the audio book, you could just sort of be like, oh, okay, so I think I'm kind of following this. He's telling me. And you don't have to work at it. Mm -hmm. as much when it's being told to you than when you have to read it and interpret it for some reason? Yeah. I was also kind of relieved that we changed point of views. Um, I was getting a little concerned that the singular journalistic journal mm -hmm. point of view would become a little tiring after a while. Um, I was like, wow, we've got a lot of time to fill here. That's a lot of stuff he has to talk about. But then we switched to to the NASA JPL point perspective and some other like third party perspectives and that that made it a little easier. When he got a little wonky when he was doing the the uh, JPL side stuff too. Uh, I didn't feel like it got too political, but I was glad he didn't ignore that and and he brought the the bureaucratic side of it in and what would happen with you know what the mm -hmm. government's going to do and with totally different motivations than just bringing the mission home. Right. The PR, the PR character served very well in sort of expressing that real politic perspective. Yeah, she was pretty funny. Um, also, I had just flown into Beijing as I was reading the section where they're flying into Beijing. Oh, really? And, yeah, so I was like, <laughs> wow. yeah, I just did that 14-hour flight. Like, oh, Actually, I flew into Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong flew into Beijing, so I'd done it like two days before. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still, still kind of funny. I'm like reading about the Chinese space program and learning about that. And, and then I started kind of wondering, like, how true is all that? Like, yeah. I'm in China. I wish there was a way I could find she out. Left. But that's highly unlikely. <laughs> yes, random American woman, let's tell you our space secrets. <laughs> so how many you spaces asked. do you have? Just, huh? You know, round, just ask people, like, how many, you know, round, round number. Doesn't have to be exact. Do you have a lander I could borrow? <laughs> So, For any reason? hypothetically, if I needed a lander. Yeah. You guys would just give us that, you right? Hook me up? We'll, send, we'll, we'll stick one of your guys on Mars. Don't worry. Yeah. It'll happen. It'll happen. Um, but all, otherwise, I loved uh, Watney's voice. I thought he was very funny. There are a couple little, like, homophobic jokes, maybe, that I thought were a little out of place. I don't remember those. There's, like, um, one or two. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. Like, it was funny, but like maybe not necessary. Um, but then he's a character, so maybe well, that's yeah, how his character it's, is. Uh, maybe he's trying to capture that kind of personality as well. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I, I liked it. I liked his letters to the fellow astronauts uh, or mm -hmm. cosmonauts, um, kind of telling them, like, just go for it. You know you like her. It was a really interesting way of developing the characters of his fellow team members through mm -hmm. his eyes, right? I liked that as well. Because it, you don't have a lot of opportunities to develop these characters because they're not there. And, and you don't want to go to their POV a lot because there's no motivation for it, especially in the early parts of the novel. Right. Um, and I did like... Um... I, I, I just realized my face was clicked in this video. I hope I wasn't on myself for this entire podcast. That would be really irritating. Audio people watching. will never notice. They'll never know. They'll never know. If you just want to see my face for 45 minutes, check out the YouTube video. Um, anyway, um, I thought the book was great, uh, especially for you know a first-time novelist. It was, it was very impressive. And 
all, all the accolades he's receiving, I think, are well-deserved. And uh, I can't wait to see what he does next, whether it's in this universe or, or something else. Now, Eric on our uh, Goodreads forum was having a little peril overload. Uh, just finished Wool right before The Martian. Uh. Uh, she says, don't get me wrong, both of these books were amazing. Just so much peril. Looking for something to read now in either the sword or laser genre that is light, a little lighter on the peril front. And mm -hmm. Uh, Terp Kristen agreed. Uh, a few other people chimed in as well, uh, saying that. I, you know, like I said, I'm I like the genre, so it's it's cool by me. But I I can get where you wouldn't want to read those back to back if that's not your thing. Yeah, it's a survival tale. Um, that is kind of what what a survival tale means. Um, they're trying, you know, with every fiber they're being to survive the situation they've been thrown into, and things are, you know, the crap is flying from every direction. So I think it makes sense. But, yeah, there were definitely some moments where I was like, oh, God, can't he just, like, hang out for a few days and we can just relax and listen to disco for a while? It would be boring, though. I know Come it on. would be I boring. Mean, and the, and the thing is, you know in these stories that they're going to survive. You can usually tell who's going to survive. And in a castaway story, the castaway is the only character. So you know the castaway is going to survive. So to me, it's like, well, you've got to Well, would it be more interesting him for him not to survive? Well, I mean, okay. Be, if, if like he didn't at the last minute, he didn't make it, and all the journals and, and were actually you, recovered from the have or yes, the have. you can do that, but it's it's a cheat to some people who are like, "What? He didn't survive," and they're going to be even angrier about that. I'm not saying it's the wrong way to go, but like the idea of the peril and then the guy dies at the end is even darker. And I, you're totally right. That Grim that is a direction Tom. you can go. Grim dark survival. <laughs> It's cast away dark. Cast, cast a dark. Away. Cast dark away. Dark away. Um, but given the fact that most of the time they do survive, you want that peril because otherwise you're just going to get bored going like, well, I know I know he's going to make it out of here and he's just But if you know they're going to Well, but yeah, but if you know they're going to survive, then the peril isn't really peril. No, but it's you a mystery spend... story at that point, right? Which is like, okay, pretty sure he's going to survive. So how the hell is he going to make it out of this? Because it seems like he couldn't make it out of it. But right? he had a magic solution for everything. He had a magic well, didn't math solution for everything. And it always came real a little bit too easy, I think. I didn't think it came too easy. He was like, really? I'm going to need a way to figure this thing out. And then the next chapter, he's like, I solved it. I figured it out. <laughs> he never was that easy, yes, though. Yes. He was always like, well, I think this might work, but I don't know. And of course it worked. Or else it'd have been like, and sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes he had to start over. Like, well, that didn't work. But it still worked. It still all no, worked. No, he had to. Because... He came up with something else that worked. But it all still worked. He still figured it out. In the end, it worked. So you would have rather Watney died. I can tell. No, I like him. I just. Why do you no. want to kill Watney? <sighs> I really, at the end of the book, I was like flipping out. Like that, those last few chapters were so tense. Oh yeah. So tense. I was like in an airport on my way to Chengdu, and I was like, "Don't talk to me." <laughs> Must save Watney. I have to finish the book. He's not possibly gonna get off this planet alive. Yeah. Gosh, what a nightmare that would be getting stuck on Mars. Can you imagine what kind of movie this is gonna make, though? A really pretty awesome movie. Tamahome uh, posted, I think the funny parts would play well in a movie, but explaining all the science might be difficult. Although she points out, or he points out, well, I'm sorry, Tamahome. Why do you I always call Tamahome a girl? Apollo 13 pulled it off. He's a boy. Uh, Tamahome the boy said that Apollo 13 pulled it off, so maybe they could with the Martian. Well, the uh, problem with the Martian is that so much of it is in his head. You have to figure out how to, like translate all his funny insides like does he just talk to himself the whole time does he make a little Wilson friend like yeah that? right it's got to be like Tom Hanks they're gonna have to have a Wilson yeah uh, Dara said I think they're making it into a movie I saw something about Matt Damon as Watney so I looked it up and yes as a matter of fact the Hollywood reporter says that Ridley Scott is in negotiations to direct Matt Damon in The Martian so it'd be don't a Ridley shit, Scott movie shit. too that'd be pretty awesome yeah. um, I like Matt Damon Though I liked also, people were talking in the forum, I'm Matt Damon. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the forums were talking about, like, we don't really know Mark Watney's race or, like, what he, like, we kind of have, a, I don't think they ever say if he's if he's a white guy because people are saying, oh, another, you know, white guy in peril figures it out using, like, <laughs> it would have been nice if there was a little more mixed race. Yeah, Robert Avail's like roles. Danny Glover as Watney. He's got geek cred. He's got incredible comic timing. He's too old. He's about the right age now. No. Oh. 
And he has a great Donald dramatic Glover, range. Not Danny Glover. No, Danny Glover, not Donald Glover. Right. The young Who, one. Whoever the younger one is. Also a rapper. <laughs> Even if you just pay attention to a sitcom work. I, oh, um, yeah, he's on Community. I'm, I'm hip to the cool, guys. I totally yeah, know. Yeah, not Danny Glover, the 67-year-old, as Michelle points out. Donald Glover. Donald Glover. Okay. I think it was a typo by Robert that okay. I passed along. Okay. But yes, Donald Glover. Donald Glover. <laughs> Donald Glover would be a little old. That's why I was like, he's too old. I love him, but he's too old. Donald Glover. Um, but I like that. I like that idea, Donald Glover. And yeah, Andy Weir left that wide open, which I thought I think is kind of cool. Unless I'm misremembering myself. But um, one thing that Andy told us when we interviewed him was he didn't think the guy was as rough and tough as the audiobook made him sound. The audiobook made him sound kind of like a like a badass, and Andy's like, no, I wrote him more as like kind of a dweeby geek uh, mm. who, who made geeky jokes, but it just goes to show you, like, you can play him in a lot of different directions. And then uh, Paulo has a thread about, uh, what does NASA think about The Martian? He goes on to say, I finished the book in less than a week, and I could not be far from the book for more than a few hours. Ooh. I have to admit that if you're not into science, the book might tire you out, but if you know the difference between oxygen and hydrogen... Um, I know Andy Weir did a lot of research before writing the book, but I wonder what NASA has to say about it. Entirely plausible? Do they recognize some part of the story as not possible? What about the technology used? Is everything described on the book being developed by NASA, or at some point it just became theoretically possible? Um, have anyone found any interviews where NASA commented on the story, or even better, do we have a NASA employee within the ranks of our humble book club? We didn't have a NASA employee. We have a Terp Kristen. Aerospace engineer. Yeah, Terp Kristen um, kind of blew this thing out of the water. Uh, I'm not going to read her entire post because it is uh, quite long, but she answers a lot of the points um, that Paulo asked about um, and, and uh, discussions from other podcasts uh, and from our interview with Andy. Uh, apparently, Commander Chris uh, Hadfield also read the book and really liked it, um, but but she kind of had issues with like the radiation, for example, some some technical parts with the uh, the convenience uh, of the uh, Eva suit, the uh, EVA suit. Um, so yeah, there was there was stuff she had comments on as a as an aerospace engineer, um, and she's done some work for human mission related stuff, and also works in a laboratory or worked in a laboratory uh, where she got to do tons of uh, astronaut type things. Um, including using spacesuit gloves and working in a spacesuit. So I think she, pretty qualified to make some of these uh, answers. Yeah, Terp Kristen says the book had a lot right, even if it overlooked some things, uh, and says it doesn't matter. This book isn't about the space accuracy. It's about the mental and emotional states. It's about the people. Uh, and even says my sister, who is a counseling psychologist, may be better equipped to talk about that part. Mm. But if you want to get her in-depth uh, explanation of, of what some of the issues might be. Thank you, Terp Kristen. There is a an article length post in this thread about the parts where she's like, okay, if you want to pick on it, these are the things that stuck out to her as an right. actual aerospace engineer. Absolutely. Um, so I think that that would be a good way to kind of wrap up the discussion about The Martian by Andy Weir. Um, yeah, great input from everyone. I think the discussions in the forums this month were really spot on and uh, really interesting, and I'm glad you guys enjoyed the book. It seems like most people enjoyed the book. Um, we've had some pretty 50-50 choices in the recent past, and it seemed like a lot of you liked this one. At least I hope so. I hope so, you didn't hear me burp just now. Powder Mage Trilogy. I thought that was me. Powder Mage Trilogy kicks off next month uh, mm -hmm. with Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan. You don't have to read the trilogy, but Promise of Blood is the one we're reading. And then uh, July will be another Lasers pick, and I think it's going to be dictatorial. We've had a couple of votes in a row, but I'm, I'm going to have to meditate. I'm going to have to go into okay. my yurt and like kind of... Ponder. They're calling for some lady books and lady, yeah. well, lady interviews. So maybe we've we should been pretty good about that. keeping the uh, the gender ratio at 50-50 oh, yeah. on the picks. Let's I'm explain that a little bit. So we didn't really, I wasn't able to jump into this thread um, because I was in China and I couldn't log into Goodreads. And and Tom kind of stayed out of it as well because I wasn't there also to kind of, you know, it would have been an unbalanced uh, gender an, ratio. Uh, exactly. Um, 
so you know I think we, we've tried really hard over the course of the book club to keep things very uh, you know gender balanced in terms of the books that we read and also the authors we have on the show and I think a lot of the balance also comes from the video show where we've had you know it's been almost 50 50 percent women uh, that we've interviewed for that um, I think what you guys are seeing recently is all Mike Cole's fault. Um, I think we're just going to put the blame directly on Mike Cole. He's going to throw Mike under the bus. He's going to throw him under the bus. Um, we he's, had him on the show. He's a pretty tough guy. He might survive. He could take it. He could take it. Um, so we had Mike Cole on the show, and then that led to this like literal avalanche of friends of Mike Cole who were like, oh, hey, I'd like to come on. Or Mike was like, you should have this person on. We're like, yeah, that sounds great. And so just for a few months there, we had we, we got very backlogged with, with interviews for the off weeks that were all FOMC, friends of Mike Cole. And, um, BFOMC. Best friends of Mike Cole. Oh, boy. Boyfriends of Mike Cole. <laughs> I don't know about boyfriends, but. Boyfriends? Oh, okay, I'm fine with that. I mean, I don't that know, is, maybe. I am okay with that mental image. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> shut up, shut up, Tom, shut up, shut up. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of why that happened. And also, the people who have been reaching out to us for interviews have been almost exclusively male as well. Um, so it's been more that you know we've we've been looking for for people to come on the show for the off weeks, uh, and maybe we need to be more diligent about seeking out. Uh, female authors to interview for those off weeks. It's just been we were kind of inundated with interview requests um, from guys recently, and it just kind of happened that way. So it wasn't wasn't a a thing we thought about. It just kind of was a thing that happened to us, and we loved having all the interviews we had. But yes, we recognize that there has been a a gender imbalance in the off week interviews of, of late. So we'll we'll definitely try to get more female authors on the show because we know that's really important to you. It's important to me as well. Um, it's just been, yeah, it, it kind of, the numbers just happened that way. It was, it was in no way, uh, you know, premeditated in any sense. The species balance, on the other hand, is entirely intentional. We only really want to interview humans. Um, I would interview a dog if a dog wanted to talk to me about if books. If a dog could talk about its writing, totally would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Be okay. Or, or chimps, if, if chimps are writing books on their 100 typewriters, I, I would interview the chimps. Chimps are kind of mean and aggressive when they hunt. I was just reading. You've been seeing too many previews for. The no, no, I was reading this in Scientific American. Movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know There's who's nice? Certain... Who? Pandas. Don't rub the panda in my face. Oh, I'd rub That's a panda belly in my face. <laughs> rub a motorboat a panda belly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's like... I would have gotten kicked out of the country if I had done that pretty sure. Yeah, I pet a panda. It was awesome. Yeah, I know. I saw the picture. I know. Most people did. If you yeah. follow me on the internet, I, I spread it like wildfire. It's kind of hard to avoid. I almost caused an international incident trying to tuck a panda into my pants to take it home with me. Uh, that didn't Play really color happen. Veronica Panda Pants Belmont. I wish they would. I so wish they, they would. Know. Anyway, uh, that about wraps it up for this episode of The Sword and Laser. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we are on the Boing Boing Podcast Network. Uh, you can find many more shows over at boingboing.net slash category slash podcasts. Great stuff over there, and thank you to them for supporting us and supporting the show. And if you want to get in touch with us, the email address is feedback at swordandlaser.com. The website is swordandlaser.com. All of our discussions happen over on goodreads.com, and the phone number is 415 7 Sword 6. We will see you guys next time. Adios. Bye.